Uh, adjacent to the Tora Bora area. That uh, is uh, right on the edge of uh, the Koi Sophie. And uh, the Tora Bora area was, of course, the area where we were going to revenge ourselves on Osama bin Laden and failed. And then we had the high mountains going up to 24,000 feet. And they are uh, right on the edge of K2 and Godwin Austin and so forth. Average rainfall? Average rainfall? I would say snowfall is more important. The average rain, so rainfall is practically nothing. Cobble, I think, has sort of like six, six inches a year. And uh, when you get further south, it even gets less. And um, most of the, the natural water occurring there is a byproduct of, uh, of snowfall, snow melt. Okay, when was it discovered by the West? Well, it was in 1786. That's the first mention of anything in the area by any Western newspaper. It happened to have been the, uh, the London Times, and at that time Kashmir was integral to Afghanistan, and here you go, as a Kashmir, uh, Saturday, uh, okay, a little uh, really military action, amazingly enough. In 1802, we have a, a system of geography for children in common schools that uh, it, it's non-existent. There is no such thing as Afghanistan in the Western world. A little bit later, in 1820, we have uh, Daniel Adams, and uh, he talks about Persia and so forth, and he describes Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, and jumps right over Afghanistan. However, by 1838, Britain had lost the first of its three wars with the Afghans. I'm not even going to try. You'll, uh, I'll uh, give you a few moments. You can go over that. It's, uh, one continuous activity for a place that no one has ever heard of until they started uh, showing pictures of burkas and women who are being suppressed. It has a rather long history, however. <laughs> Notable here, of course, is uh, Genghis Khan, who destroyed the whole damn country. His kid, Tamir Lang, uh, who is uh, Tamir the Lame, this guy had a club foot, and uh, he ruled for a while there, and uh, finally uh, his uh, uh, progeny gave out, and somebody else came in, and on and on like that. At the end of this, uh, 1747, we had Afghanistan, and we had uh, Duranese come up. The recent stuff, we have uh, more fighting and what have you, and we have intrigues and nonsense, and the British lose the second Afghan war by... 1879, they lose the third one in uh, 1919, as a matter of fact. So uh, they've, they've had more bites at the apple than we have at this point. This comes out dumb, but what were they fighting about, or what was so valuable? Uh, they wanted the area because they wanted to control it because the Russians were coming in on the British Indian Company. And they wanted to secure it, and so they used Afghanistan as a buffer zone. And the same thing was being used against Iran as a buffer zone. It was to their advantage to have a wasteland between the, uh, the formal borders of Iran and uh, Russia and themselves. And so they took advantage of the situation and they kept installing puppets. And uh, we have a few puppets down here. Uh, we have. Uh, nine regime changes, each one of them courtesy of the British Empire in about 80 years. Okay, intrigues and assassinations prevail. Enough history. The only constants in Afghanistan are political instability and developmental stasis. In other words, every valley is a different country. Each valley, there are over 99 different languages spoken in the country, many of them completely incomprehensible to anybody else but the people in that particular valley. So basically what you have is just a, a series of countries which are loosely held together by a geography more than anything else in religion. We have here, these are the, uh, the, the uh, common threads, warlordism, lawliness, greed, exploitation, so forth from the people in Kabul. In other words, uh, these are the ruling class that uh, took advantage of the situation. It was even so bad that there was the Ahu Shoe Company, which as uh, Ahir Shah, the, uh, uh, the, the king of uh, nominal of uh, Afghanistan, uh, took it away from private enterprise and gave it to one of his cousins. 
which <laughs> we have the same thing now going on, of course. But nevertheless, uh, it's not new for them. Now, basically, when we walked in on 9-11 in our revenge uh, against uh, uh, the Taliban, so-called, or Al-Qaeda, or uh, Bin Laden, we put a civil war on hold. We interrupted basically what we did. We funded and supported the people who had just lost the civil war. Okay, I want you to think about it. They had just lost that civil war. In other words, with the demise of uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud, who was their titular leader, and uh, you had uh, Dostam, who was another man in that uh, in aggregate, had uh, gotten the hell out of Dodge and went back up into Uzbekistan. He happens to be a KGB or an ex-KGB border general, and uh, so he went home, and, and the rest of these guys were holed up above Mazari Sharif, and uh, the next thing you know, we we come in with satchels full of money, millions of dollars, and buy, I think, something like a dozen horses and put some CIA pukes on them, and uh, let them run all over the northern, they're throwing out money right and left so as to buy the uh, the uh, uh, the services, let us say, of everybody and his brother. Now, as soon as we tire of wasting money and take revenge on a bunch of maverick Arabs who are, or Arabs who are not even in Afghanistan, this civil war will uh, will take place again. What we see with the Taliban right now is uh, nothing more or less than uh, the civil war continuing. I mean, <laughs> but we make romance out of it. Now, let's take a look at what the uh, the term Afghan means. Afghan originally applied to the Pathan. Only the Pashtu people were Afghan. And they have genealogies, and there are three sections of Afghan. They are the Durani, the Khalzi, and the Kailanri. And there's Sarbandri or Bani Israel. Bani Israel is, uh, is uh, essentially uh, the, one of the lost tribes of Israel. And they will trace their, uh, their origin back uh, to the Jews. We had a gentleman who visited us, uh, Amin Wardak, uh, who was here in California, and uh, he, uh, he was quite fluent in uh, the genealogies and could trace it back uh, uh, to, uh, let me see, anyway, <laughs> he could go uh, right straight back to Moses for all intents and purposes to prove that they were with the lost tribe. Now, some people say this is nonsense, but in reality, this is why they feel. And if perception is on their side, then that's the way it is. They basically are about 75% of the population, and they dominate the region between Afghanistan and Pakistan. The biggest single group is neither Durrani nor Alzi, it is Karlanri. And you don't hear about Karlanri, you probably never heard of them. As a matter of fact, you've heard of Durrani and Alzi. But no Carl Henry. The Carl Henry uh, uh, do not have uh, uh, well established uh, genealogies, let's put it that way. They speak Pashtu, they are Pashtu, they're Patan, they're Paktu, they follow the Pakhtunwali, they uh, do the whole shot. But uh, they're the lesser of the tribes, who, all boy, they are the largest number. The other groups, of course, are the Tajik and the Hazara. The Tajik guys are Farsi speaking uh, people, and uh, they uh, are uh, really interlopers. They're sort of like uh, illegals that came into the country like our Mexican population here and uh, slowly moved in, uh, took uh, uh, artisan jobs and uh, ended up as CPAs and this sort of thing because the uh, Pashtu guys were dirt farmers and they didn't want to have anything to do with that sort of work. And so here come the, uh, the Tajiks. The Hazara are the remnants of Shingis Khan. In other words, Hazara means 1,000, and it's the satrapy that he left in the central mountains of Afghanistan, and uh, they've been there ever since. In other words, he simply put in a colony, and there they are. And they're very oriental, as you probably are aware. They uh, look more Chinese than most Chinese do. It's, a, it's very interesting. Then we have Uzbeks and Aymak and Parsiwan, Turkman and Kyrgyz. These guys are Turkic speaking, except for the Aymak and the Farsiwan. Farsiwan is a Dari Farsi or, uh, or Farsi speaking people along with the Tajiks. And uh, the Aymak uh, have their own language. They're out 